I have to apologize because I didn't have any uh, any any Eggman themed clothing to wear. I've gone for a Tails t-shirt, so I'm slightly on brand, but it's not. I had to make I had to make it a clear because I want to apologize because I know I've not I've not made the best impression there by not repping the brand correctly, you know. But I have tried the very least. That's all right. I'll allow it. <laughs> well, I didn't want to make a bad first impression, you know. They're important. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Hello and welcome back to The Redcast, the show all about exploring the world of entertainment and the many forms it takes. I'm your host, Troy, also known as Red Archer Live, and joining me today is a very, very special guest. You probably know him best as the voice of the iconic Dr. Eggman from the Sonic the Hedgehog franchise. It's Mike Pollock. How are you doing? Fantastic so much, Troy. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, it's an absolute pleasure. As I said, I had a. there's, there's been a few guests. I don't like to go too much into, you know, kind of... Uh, trying to make someone feel a bit too big headed but i had a few guests that were kind of top of my list and you were one of them and i thought i'll shoot my shot with sonic frontiers we're coming out and see what you thought and as we've discussed like you came back almost immediately and it was it was a real honor for you to be so willing for it so i really really appreciate that thank you very much sure it fit in uh, nicely time wise so i think we're all good fantastic so i want to start off this conversation before we get into a whole heap of questions including some from our community because we have uh, put out some questions for the uh, for the listeners to interact with so we'll have those towards the end but i want to start off uh, as i do with most interviews by talking about your origin so what i want to know first is how did you get into the acting industry was it a particular person that inspired you or a certain event how did that all kick off as a kid, I grew up loving uh, theater and loving radio. I would dabble in both through the course of uh, my young, my childhood and young adulthood. I did lots of school theater. I interned at a college radio station and uh, some local professional radio stations. Even when I was in college, the opportunity to intern at a radio station came up. I jumped at the chance. And also while in college, there was a community, there was essentially community theater for folks who were not acting majors at school. So the non-acting major community, there was a musical stage society they got, got to be part of. And even when I was working in radio, choosing radio as a slightly more stable profession, it was for a while. It didn't turn out to be that way for a long term. But even when I was working in radio, evenings were free to continue pursuing community theater. And then when radio decided it had enough of me, I realized that I could parlay the acting part of uh, my background into something more full time. So I dabbled uh, in uh, voiceover and it's been that way ever since 2008 and forward. And I do commercials and cartoons and anything that can't speak for itself. People are quite, uh, quite willing to hire me, apparently. Oh, uh, yeah. You've got quite the impressive range. We'll talk about it later. But there's a, I, and I've noticed in particular on your YouTube channel, you've got that playlist with like 60 different examples of acting roles. And like, there's been a mm -hmm. lot that you've done. And I mean, even just as we'll get to Eggman, we'll start off with that in a second. But just to think that you've been playing him alone for how many years now? 19 years? Like it's, it's, and change. it's one of the, it's one of the few voices that kind of has stood the test of time across that franchise. And to think, you know, for me personally, I think I said to you when I first pitched this to you that I've, I've only been playing Sonic since 2005. So the fact that you've been voicing him longer than I've been playing kind of blew my mind a little bit. I hadn't realized it'd been quite so long, mm -hmm. but that's not, it's fab. That's, that's a nice, that's an interesting one as well. Cause as you said, it's, it's, you know, it's designed for people who aren't majoring in acting. And that's the thing. I feel like sometimes when you want to get into the industry, because I considered it for a little while, it was always something that I'd kind of thought about doing. And it's, it's never quite left the back of my mind, but there is kind of that stigma where you think if you've not trained in it as you're growing up or done any kind of practice, then it's harder to get into. But that's not the case at all, really, is it? It helps to have some natural ability because some people think, especially with voiceover, oh, it's just talking. Yeah. It's really not. <laughs> There, it's one thing to have a voice. It's one thing to be able to do funny voices, but you have to be able to take the voices and make them do what the director wants you to do. And not everyone can do that. As I, as I often say, our skill is reading aloud without sounding like we're reading. And a lot of people can't do that. They will read something and it will sound like they are reading. And no, it doesn't work. So yeah, you got to have some skill or you've got to be able to acquire that skill in such a way that uh, to make it sound like you're not doing anything. Yeah, exactly. I mean, if you, if you can't, then your role's going to be pretty limited. Maybe a couple of droids in Star Wars, but you're not going to get much more beyond that, I wouldn't have thought. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So let's let's talk about, because we're obviously going to have quite a bit of, a, of an Eggman-based focus here. We're going to look at everything as a whole uh, later on, but obviously your most iconic character, so you'd be, you'd be, uh, I'd be, I wouldn't be forgiven for not focusing on that for a little bit. Um, so to start off with, I've, I've got to know, because as you said, it's been such a long time you played this role. You've played Eggman across so many different games, as well as other bits with TV series, things like that we'll no doubt explore. But how did you initially land that role? How did that come about? 
Uh, once I had, uh, I was moonlighting on my day job at the time, and I was moonlighting doing cartoons because the opportunity presented itself. And I got in with the folks at Four Kids Productions, who were developing their Four Kids TV Fox Box Saturday Morning Animation Block. Uh, they were also producing Pokemon. They had me audition for stuff. They seemed to like me. And the uh, producer of Kirby, right back at you, also was assigned to produce Sonic X. And when they were trying to cast it and he was looking for ideas, and he was very interested in submitting me for the role of Dr. Eggman. So they gave me clips of Dean Bristow, Dean Bristow to voice match. And so I listened to Dean Bristow and I tried to master my Dean Bristow impression. <laughs> went in for an audition, went in for a callback, went in for another callback. All the times doing the Dean Bristol voice, rah, 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 rah. and by that third callback, they finally decided, yeah, I guess that'll do, and then they cast me as uh, Doctor Eggman on Sonic X. <laughs> you knocked their socks off, so to speak, <laughs> from the sounds of it. Presumably. <laughs> oh, that's brilliant, and that's the thing that I think a lot of people won't realize is that your first role as Eggman wasn't in a game; it was in Sonic X. Absolutely. Yeah. Sonic X. Also, I played Ella the maid, which many people don't realize. Yeah, you've had different roles in other things, especially in the same show, especially with Sonic Boom. I remember I saw a clip of that and there were a couple of voices and I didn't realise it was you. And then once I clocked it, I thought, I like, wow, he really, like the different voices you can do, you can do quite a range. Like there, there, it's, it's safe mm -hmm. to say the range you can do. So once you got the role as Eggman on Sonic X, how did that then translate into the games? Did they like you in the show and then bring you in? How did that crossover happen? There was no specific instruction just one day. Oh, we're recording a game next week. Can we book you for this time? Sure. And all of a sudden, there we were doing games. So apparently, the idea was to make the game sound like the uh, the uh, new dub of Sonic X, and that continued on. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, that's, what, that's what I wondered, because obviously, they're the same franchise, but two different things. So it's about kind of how they connected and whether it had the same you know, creative minds behind it, because some sometimes they do, obviously, and sometimes they don't. Um, but yeah, so because that's that's why when you said, you know, properly became your full career in 2008, I was thinking, well, hang on, 2003, how did that that line up? So it, it's it's funny that you managed to land that such a big, well, in retrospect, such a big role so early on. So quite a, a lucky kind of turn of events, I suppose. Mm -hmm. It's Acting is completely unpredictable, and that's why a lot of people like love it, me included. I barely know what I'm doing later this week or next week. <laughs> That's always what I find so funny is that, like you said, you don't you don't know what's coming at the end of the week. That it's a it's a fairly unique profession, I would say, when it comes to that. Because like obviously we're having this conversation on Tuesday, you do, you don't know what's happening on a Friday, for argument's sake. I'm constantly auditioning for new roles. Just just because I have one role that'll cover a couple of days, and then I got nothing else to do. That's no fun. The idea of uh, voiceover is to keep your calendar as full as possible. So if I'm not recording, I'm auditioning for new things to record. And if people like me, they'll hire me, and then I get to record more stuff. Exactly. Yeah. There's always there's always something new, and that was why uh, this brings me quite well into my next question. To be fair, I noticed because I've done quite a lot of research. Because uh, unlike, I mean, obviously a lot of voice actors have got their own websites where they pitch their things, but yours is very very in depth. You've got so much on there. Just whether it's you talking about voice acting as a professional, your resume, and all that. But one thing I really picked out that I noticed was that you specified with Eggman in particular that you spend four hours a year recording for Eggman for a, for a game. Approximately. Uh, Frontiers was a total of four sessions and each of them was four hours or fewer because uh, it's when the script is ready, they call us in. It's all about efficiency. We cost a lot of money to be there. So you want to make the most efficient use of our time. So when the script is ready to record or enough of the script is ready to record, they call in the actors, we come in and record and then they go off and do more game development stuff. But yeah, for Frontiers, we recorded some stuff. They did some more work in the game. They had more script ready. They called us in again. Called us in a couple more times, all recording separately, and then they were done and they made a game out of it. Wow, okay. So based on that then, that kind of answers a bit of my question. So what is the process like for recording Fragman was going to be my next question. So we kind of touched on that a little bit. So you called in for sessions based on, you know, how much the script is ready. Do you do it all yourself? Do you do it with anyone else present? Like, how does that work? Games tend to record separately. It's me in the room and it's the production team on the other side of the glass or on the other side of the country. Generally, because I'm in New York and they're in LA or Japan, we are recording remotely, connected via the internet, usually watching on little thumbnail screens, kind of like we are now. And it's very much a collaborative press process. I'm taking direct orders from the director, but he's consulting with the rest of the team. And we collaborate to make sure that I'm giving the team what they want. 
Okay, yeah, and it's just the it's the lack of time because I've I've spoken to a lot of people in the in the Payday game franchise. And if you heard of Payday Two, that's one that I've spoken to a lot of actors from there, and they they note about having these kind of very vocal heavy sessions for a couple of hours, and then you know they move on from that because there's a lot of screaming involved in that. I always do find it interesting that because. You, know, you think when you've got a big game releasing, especially with Frontiers, which we can obviously explore in specific shortly, but with the game as big as that, you almost kind of think, well, how long? It must take like days and days and weeks to record all these things, but it always surprises people, or it surprised me originally, especially when you realise that it's all quite compacted. There's not as much to it in terms of time frame as you might think. Sure, and all you need is our dialogue, and then the game folks put it where it belongs. So we're not doing the game in real time. It might take you 20 hours to play the game, but here's a list of lines. Okay, I'll say this, this, this. You like that? Great. Next one, next one. And then there's your dialogue. Do what you're going to do with it. Yeah, job done. It's it's kind of like just a, a small piece of it, I suppose, right? There's not... The, Absolutely. Exactly. There's so much more to it. Um, which then mm -hmm. brings me on to, specifically, Sonic Frontiers. Because it feels like, obviously, not just because it's just released, but it's the perfect time to talk about this. Because with the game, as you've no doubt hopefully felt yourself, but also seen with the reception online, presumably, is that there's been quite a lot of critics praise for this game it's been very very well received me personally i feel like you know there are a couple of games i've not played in the past be it on for platform restrictions but i've as i've said been playing sonic for about 17 years now and i think probably frontiers might be my favorite game it, it's quite a unique beast there's a lot to it that makes it very special but one thing with you in regard in particular or the voice actors i should say is there seems to have been a noticeable change in the direction in the way that the voice mm -hmm. was done at the performance can you talk us through how the performance for, for frontiers was different to maybe previous sonic games sure it was surprisingly simple at least from my standpoint they said we're going for a, a more realistic almost a darker tone in this game and that was all I needed to know. That's that's my acting notes. It okay. And then as we went through line by line, is that what you want? Great. Next. Okay. Moving on. So it's very clinical. It's very detached. But it's still there's a lot of craft. But even so, the craft is so refined that we can just go in and I'm not acting. I'm acting. Look at me acting. Okay. I'm done acting. It's it's it's. <laughs> People want to think that I'm living life as the character. It's really not. It's very much. Okay, now we're working. Now we're off stage. Okay. So you are very much able to just kind of switch Eggman off like a light switch. Yeah, absolutely. I'm not a method actor. Probably by design at this point, but there's no reason to be. I'm a short order cook more than anything else. If I'm in a session playing three different roles, it doesn't make sense to get so deeply involved in one when in 20 minutes I'll be doing a different role. So It's a good point. Yeah. I feel, I feel like that's though, like not every actor can do that as well, right? Is that some people will have to try and get back into the flow of it. And I mean... With Eggman specifically, I mean, over the last few years, unless I'm forgetting something in particular, bar, because I'm not sure where the boom overlap ha happens, obviously the mainline Sonic games, there hasn't been one for five years before Frontiers, so there's no doubt been a good chunk of time between recording for Frontiers and whatever you've done previously, so I did wonder, you know, is it is it always kind of having to get yourself back in, but it seems very much like you could just do it <laughs> with the drop of a hat, really. Nope, not at all. In fact, one of the things that uh, that is a very helpful to uh, to us when we do that is the vocal reference. They'll keep clips of previous uh, versions of our records around so that we know we're matching the voice. And as long as we're matching the voice and the acting behind it, we're good to go. Okay, wow. Um, and that's what, uh, that, the thing I find so funny is what you said is that it's it's funny how just a single sentence can change everything. As you said, we're going for a darker tone. And that's pretty much all you needed for your direction. It, it feels so strange sure. because it feels like such a marked departure. You think there'd be more to it, but of course it's just, it's all about that direction. Um, did it feel mm -hmm. at all different playing him in that sense, knowing that you were doing it differently? Or was it just kind of another, just a, another little notch about another way to do it differently? It's another acting challenge. I was delighted to take a different approach. I've taken a darker, realistic approach with Dr. Eggman in the past in a couple of scenes in Sonic X, a couple of other games along the way. This was the first time that it was such an extended, realistic performance. But no, it was it was a delightful challenge. And as long as the uh, production team was happy, they let me leave. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, yeah, otherwise, they just keep you locked in forever. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no. They got what they wanted and <laughs> smiles all around. <laughs> oh, that's, that drives you even more to get it done quickly then. Eh? So you can move on to the next job. You know, give the best performance and then off he goes to the next thing. <laughs> sure. Well, that's it's it's people don't... People also forget it is work. It's a job. Now, most people equate jobs with drudgery. I hate my job. We love our job. but And because we're good at what we do, we can get our job done quickly. And then there's no reason to hang around 
the game de- the development team, the producers have other stuff to do. I've got other stuff to do, so we don't hang around much. It's it's really based on efficiency. When you wrap, you wrap, and you off you go. Yeah, it's 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 interesting to know that. It's interesting to kind of explore that idea. And like you said, because it's a different direction, I was going to ask, and I think I've kind of got a tiny bit of an impression uh, from what you said for Frontiers. Do you have a particular Sonic performance that stands out to you the most as one that you know this is like? my peak as Eggman or something something that you said maybe or a certain angle to it that stands out as I look back on this fondly. I make a point of not playing favorites because ah. well, for a variety of reasons. First of all, you're the audience. You can have favorites. <laughs> my favorite, my joy comes from performing. The fact that I get to do this for a living as a career is spectacular. So my favorite gig will always be the next one. I have so much fun whenever I'm doing whatever I'm doing that that's my favorite. So, no, I'm glad people like my performance, but I'm, I'm not going to pick one client over the other. That's not fair to all the others. And I'm not going pick to pick one, one performance over the other. Same reason, not fair. And it's not a competition. I get to act. I'm living my dream. So, no, there's no, that's my favorite part, is performing. I, I, I love the energy you've got about this. I have to be honest. Just the idea that Thank just you. doing it is just, that's all you need. You know, that's a really kind sure. of beautiful thing. And I don't think everyone has that. That's a really nice perspective to have, I suppose. And it's true. You know, it is that, like the players will always sometimes unnecessarily, but they'll always have their opinions. You know, the way, whether regardless of how they phrase it, they'll always have their own judgments to make. And, sure. and that's interesting. But yeah, I just... For me personally, I can give you the compliment. Then I can just say that I, like, I personally thought the betrayal of Eggman in Frontiers was fantastic. And as I've, as I said to you at one point, it was it's the first Sonic Frontier Sonic game, sorry, that made me feel sorry for Eggman, which I thought was a really, thank you, really interesting spin. That's not to say obviously past performances, but just the way it was written. I suppose it, it's mainly with the interaction with Sage, with having the kind of father daughter relationship that took place there, was just. I, I don't know how much, how much of the finished game have you actually seen, like an execution? Because obviously you've done your voice lines and moved on. Sure. I've seen some cutscenes. I've seen trailers. But not being a gamer, I, I don't relate to games in the same way a player does. <laughs> uh, I want to see, you know, I'd love to see how it's all put together, but I don't have the patience to watch. Oh, he's running. Oh, he's running again. Oh, look, he's jumping. Now he's running. Okay, running. All right. Okay, got it. No, that's fair enough. I was going to ask if you played much of the Sonic games, but I think I'm getting the impression that maybe maybe not so much. As as I also love to say, I love to say a lot of stuff, but games hire actors because they want their games well acted. They don't care if we can play the games. It would be nice if we do, but that's not a requirement. There is, there, there's no controller. There's no joystick. There's no AB button in the booth. It's us in a script. We're acting. No, it's it's probably better that way, I suppose, isn't it? You can you can detract from that and just focus more on the performance. Um, sure. But yeah, I just I just think because that's why I mean it was so noticeable. I feel like the way that the direction was done differently, and just even the tone of voice and some of the comments, like specifically one that stood out to me was your, the first cutscene in Cyberspace with Eggman, where he, where he makes the comment about how advanced the system is, and then just goes, "Note to self, don't admit that to anybody." It was just like these little little things. I just thought really stood out and kind of made it feel a bit more i don't know there's there's a word for it and i can't quite think about think of it but it's just a bit more i'm going to say grounded not quite the right word but something on those lines and it's it's interesting to know and as as i've said the fact that it all links to one line i think is just is phenomenal that it's it's so so much can change based on just the snap of a thing of just do this a little bit darker just do this a little bit differently do this with a, a different edge it's fascinating i do really find it interesting yeah, it's based on the script we get, and it's based on the direction we get, and the combination thereof, magic happens. But for folks that like to complain, Eggman's always so goofy. Well, the scripts are written to be goofy, and if I were to play the goofy part seriously, that wouldn't work right. Yeah, exactly. So, yes, if they want him to be goofy, I damn well better play him goofy, or else I won't be playing him very often. As An actor's job is to take direction. It's not a uh it's not a militaristic experience with you will read the lines this way it's very much here read the line good but let's try it this way okay we'll do it till we get it right we get it right so it's collaborative but it's also their vision not mine i am the ingredient in the souffle and it better turn into a souffle when it's done or else it falls and and no one's happy yeah no that was that was going to be my next question because with a character like eggman who you, now you've played for so long and is so iconic, I wanted to know kind of how much of a custodian of it you are in the sense that you get a say at all and how it's performed. Like, how much, how often do you get to say, 
I'm not sure. Would he say this slightly differently, or is it very much you do just kind of rely on the the script? How much kind of agency do they give you in that regard? The script is generally correct. I will point out grammatical errors if something <laughs> is tripping up in my brain, saying, "Is that English? Is that right? Are you sure about that?" But generally, they know the characters better than I do. I will give performances that they might expect or a line reading they might not expect, and that's delightful. But it's their character. They have they've been kind enough to choose me to breathe life into his words and 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 put his words out into the world. But it's not my character. I don't own any of the characters. I am a voice for hire, just as if I was on stage. It's Shakespeare's characters. I just got picked to play Hamlet once. I haven't played Hamlet. Someday I will. Um, but yeah, it's I'm inhabiting a character. And as long as the director likes what I'm doing and the audience responds favorably, then that would continue, one would hope. Yeah, you would hope. I mean, to be fair, you could say maybe you're you're the video game Hamlet, you could say. You know, it's it's an iconic character. You could maybe maybe try and link it to that and then say you played Hamlet in of sorts, possibly. Mm, yes, but uh, as we're seeing now with uh, things like the films and Sonic Prime, it's becoming a little more of a timeshare arrangement. Does seem so. like that, yeah, yeah. I was I was surprised to hear that you, that you weren't going to be voicing Eggman in Sonic Prime. I did that did surprise me. Um, I suppose that's mm. just you weren't asked. Can I ask about that at all? Is it's a Canadian production, and I am not a Canadian production. There you go. Question answered. So Problem Canadian solved. Canadian contact rules. Yeah, <laughs> yeah fair I, enough. I, I I didn't qualify. That's simple as that. Well, it makes more sense because I mean, if it had just been the Eggman's voice had changed, you would have been like, well. What's going on there? But it's like the entire voice cast is different. So I did think there was mm -hmm. kind of some kind of production thing involved there. So that makes that makes sense. And as we also love to say, that's showbiz, kid. That's very true. That is that is painfully true. Very, very true. But hopefully, obviously, mm -hmm. as we've said, that's that's doesn't apply to the games. You know, I mean, I, I, I certainly want a Frontiers 2. I know a lot of people want that. And for that and beyond, we don't want anyone else playing Eggman. You know, you've been in for so, you've been here for so long. Hopefully, long may it continue. Um, and speaking Thank of community you. response... We have to touch a little bit on kind of the community's view and the way that Sonic interacts with the community because there's a, there's a few games that have good community interactions. As I've said, I've got a bit of a connection with the folks with Payday 2 and they're very good with talking with their audience. But one thing that I love in particular that Sonic does is the Twitter takeovers, which for people mm -hmm. listening who may not understand, every time there's a new Sonic game that releases, they will get some of the voice actors together to answer questions from the community and you'll answer them in character as a group and it genuinely and i mean this is one of the coolest things that i've seen video games do whenever one gets announced it's always good fun and i did think once frontiers had come out and they hadn't said it i was like they're gonna they're gonna do it a, a community uh twitter q a this time or are they not gonna not gonna do one and then you got announced thought fantastic so do you know how those came about like how did they originate the first one i i blazed that trail i guess um the folks at sega uh, emailed to say we're doing a thing and uh, it would really help for you to be here to do that. And it was just Eggman taking over Sonic's Twitter account. So they were kind enough to fly me out, business trip style, expense reports and everything. And then it was me in a conference room along with the social media team, uh, the Sonic Boom writing team at the time, and uh, some audio producers. And they started on Twitter. They opened it up to questions. We took questions. We wrote them on the fly. They wrote the responses. I read the responses. And they produced them into the cute little animations. And people seem to really like it. So the next uh, time around, it was me and Roger with Sonic and Eggman. Then it was me, Roger, and Kirk as we added Shadow. Then me, Roger, Kirk, and Colleen uh, adding Tails. And then this past one, then there was a virtual one, which I think was also the same bunch of people. And then the last one in person was me, Roger, Kirk, Colleen, Roger, no, I said Roger. Me, uh, Dave, David B. Mitchell, and um, Cindy Robinson. Yeah, it was it was the, the biggest cast, wasn't it? Mm hmm. And we all got together and basically did uh, cold reading, which we're all pretty good at. So <laughs> that was fun. We got to self direct. We don't have our usual uh, game director, the lovely and talented Jack Fletcher. Uh, not that he's not necessary and vital for the game. I was going to say but for this stuff. <laughs> yeah, for this stuff, we we figured out we can we can self direct, and then the, the social media team is over uh, is over uh, over watching and making sure. Yeah, that was good. And uh, basically, we uh, have tons of fun, and they make magic out of it. Yeah, it's it's phenomenal. Because you get, was it last time? Because your social media manager didn't she say it was some like forty thousand questions you got in the last one? Forty four thousand questions. Blimey! And you answered, was it a dozen, thirteen, fourteen? Like there's a, there's a dozen, a, yes. A lot of demand. Twenty. For this. Yeah, twenty two dozen, I think, is about where we get. 
And I have to explain to people watching, you didn't answer my question. You were one of 44,000. Yeah, I, 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 I did sit there and Can't think, maybe, you. but I thought, how many people are going to ask questions? No, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, if you'd rather play the lottery, at least the lottery has a cash prize. But... <laughs> Hey, maybe getting Sonic characters to voice your questions is their cash prize. You don't know. <laughs> uh, people seem to enjoy it, and I'm so glad. But yeah, I, it, we can't answer everyone's question just because it's physically impossible. Oh, no, exactly, exactly. But that that's the thing. So like, it must no doubt be a really nice feeling to know that not only are you getting a job where you're constantly being asked to come back, it's more paid work for you at the very basis level, but also it's a role that people like so much that you end up having these extra things where you are doing these community interactions. It must be like a lovely feeling mm -hmm. for a character to have that kind of response. Absolutely. Whenever they're they're kind enough to invite me to do stuff, I'm always happy to oblige. Yeah, With, within reason, of course, because I, I, we have to mention some of the community stuff, and I want to make this clear because obviously not everyone knows this attitude, this, your attitude towards this, which is a very valid one, and I want to make sure people do hear it. Uh, I would be... Uh, foolish for not asking because everyone asked me to you have presumably seen some of the online fan dub videos etc for sonic where mm -hmm. games are sure. voiced over how many of them have you seen what are your kind of thoughts and impressions on them i don't watch most of them because i know that most of them are usually not very complimentary to the franchise indeed and i don't <laughs> i don't need to see that there, it will not benefit my characterization to see uh, someone who sounds vaguely like dr eggman being profane for the sake of being profane exactly yeah and then the folks that want me to record that, I explain, first of all, the point of the of, of a contract is, the contract says in a nutshell, we are hiring you to voice Dr. Eggman with the content we give you. So if the content doesn't originate from Sega, I'm not going to say it. Exactly. You know, if somebody, if you hire someone to paint your house, the guy next door doesn't say, okay, do me a favor, just take this can of red paint, just splatter it all over the house. No, <laughs> no. No, that's that's exactly why I asked because it's it's a really fair point. Because I when I obviously asked you, the fan dubs thing wasn't something that even was in, in the front of my mind. I was like, I want to know about Eggman, I want to mm -hmm. know about Frontiers. And then someone said to me, they went, What about what about the fan dubs? And I thought, well, I suppose people are gonna want to know that. And then I saw you you replied to somebody with the, the video you made of the announcement thing, and I thought it's mm -hmm. a really valid point because obviously, you know, you don't want to be saying something that doesn't match with the character that the game studio hasn't given to you. And it's a very fair thing. So that's mm -hmm. why I wanted to bring it up. Not because I'm going to sit here and nudge you and go, come on, do it for us. Because I want, I think more people should know. You know what I mean? Well, the fans, which they, they love to get trophies at conventions and trophies are, oh, I got the actor to say a thing. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. there was the time when I did the infamous snooping as usual that um, before I knew why everyone found it so amusing. Yeah. <laughs> and I said, sure, I'll say that for you. And then... <laughs> I got Mike to do that. Ah, so it's a trophy situation, is it? And I have since locked down my dialogue requests. Basically, if I'm at a convention and you want a custom dialogue request, no. Because mm -hmm. first of all, you're not Sega. I will happily give you voice samples and I'll probably say your name in the character's voice, but don't hand me a script or say, say this line, because I'm not... I don't want to have be held responsible for, was that a real line? Is there some nefarious purpose for saying that line? Does it mean something dirty if you take it the wrong way? So, no, I'm not, I'm not there to be a trained monkey. I will give you voice samples, but I'm a human being. I'm not a request machine. Please respect that. Thank you. Exactly, exactly. Um, but yes, that's why I wanted to put that out there, because I feel like many people, not everyone knows that. So I thought it was, it was good to just kind of give that a bit of acknowledgement, because obviously... Well, sure. they might be very well loved videos and people may love them, but they are such a different beast. And it's I think it's important that you make it clear they don't they don't overlap and it's probably best that they don't. Mm -hmm. And that will offend some people that, I, that I'm not taking requests. But sorry, your name's not on the contract. Exactly. You know, some some voice actors will do that happily and some won't. And I think, you know, it's perfectly valid mm -hmm. either way. I, I, I totally get why mm -hmm. you feel that. And honestly, considering, as you said, what is said in those I can get why you wouldn't want to touch that. If it was a joke about, oh, I'm going to go down to the supermarket to buy some milk or something, and it's a little bit different, you go, well, it's a bit goofy. But yeah, as you said, it's it's certainly in one particular area there. So I do not blame you in the slightest for not wanting to touch that. I totally get it. At the end of the day, I don't own the characters. They don't belong to me. I'm only borrowed. I borrow them. I'm entrusted with them. You know, the other analogy I love to make is if you, you go to have your car valet parked, you don't expect the valet to take your car tooling down the motorway for a joyride. Exactly. You're expected to, you, you expect them to park the car and bring the car back safely. It's not your car. It's not their car. It's yours. So, yeah, yeah it's. 
So I have, I believe I've come up with a happy compromise of here's a voice sample, but it's my words, not yours. Yeah, exactly, exactly. It's a it's a it's a happy happy middle happy middle ground. Mm-hmm. Um, you did say mm-hmm. something though that that's piqued my interest because I do want to ask about this. Uh, you talked about convention appearances. Do you do a great deal of those? Uh, there have been fewer during the pandemic, but now that the pandemic is mostly behind us, uh, I've just signed with a new convention agent who uh, also represents some of our other Sonic friends, and uh, we could be a package deal at a convention near you. Oh, I hope so. If any in the UK come mm-hmm. up, I, I want you know make it make it known. Got to got to refresh the old passport. Let that lapse during the pandemic, but I got time for that too. So oh, yeah, that would be who fantastic. knows. Fingers crossed. Oh, fingers crossed. Absolutely, it would be it would be great, and especially if you say as a package deal, that'd be even even cooler. But yeah, I'm, I'm very much a fan of the of the convention scenes. It would be very cool to see some of you guys over in the mm-hmm. UK. You know, don't want to jinx it, but you never know what the future holds. Exactly. I, I, could try and make the trek out to America, but you know, if if, if you guys come to me, I, I won't complain. You know, I won't complain. Sure, we may me, we may make you hop a train to get to somewhere else in the country, but we'll meet you halfway. Exactly. Yeah, I can I can do a train. That's a little bit easier. I can do a train. That's all right. That's Perfect. all right. <laughs> oh, I really hope so. That'd be fantastic. Um, so the last thing that I want to ask with because this one is kind of a bridge into looking at other roles because it kind of applies to Eggman and kind of doesn't. Um, I'll use Eggman for the context in the sense that with a character like Eggman, he has different forms. He will appear in a video game, he will appear in a TV show, or anything in between. Is there any difference in the way that you do your performance when you know the context of where it's going to be? So if you're doing lines for, say, Frontiers, is there any way that you handle it differently to when you were recording for, say, the Sonic Boom TV series? It's really based on what the uh, production team and what the director wants. It's Obviously, I'll read the script. Uh, when when the dreaded Sonic 06, Sonic the Hedgehog, came out, <laughs> I saw the uh, the redesigned character art, and I saw dialogue about guns and killing, and I said, oh, this is a bit darker than the typical Sonic X comedy that we've been dealing with. Okay, let's go with a slightly darker tone. Uh, also, the director there was not really much of a director, so I kind of was doing a little self-direction as needed. But Ooh. it's apparent from the script, the tone the script is going for. And then the director is there making sure that I am fulfilling their vision, whatever that might be. So, no, the the, the difference, as long as the words are there and in English and are comprehensible and I can make sense out of them, I will be able to do the director's bidding to their satisfaction and make the folks behind the glass happy. Yeah, no, <laughs> well, yeah, I, I, it's funny that I find it funny you addressed 06 as, uh, as a lot of people address it. I've actually never played that one. That's one of the only Sonic games I never actually wound up playing. So I'm told you're not missing much. That's that's what I've been told. I have been trying to get hold of it, but it's not it's not so easy. It's on a platform I'm not on as much now. So uh, maybe mm. maybe it's something. My I'm part on. was good. <laughs> Watch the clips. Yeah, I think I think I might just stick to watching some cutscenes. We'll 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 see. We'll see. Um, but yeah, so that's that's because that's what I think. Because obviously, with your performance, Eggman does sound very similar. In like I said, if, for the comparison between Sonic Boom and between the games, so I just I want to know if there's any different. But it is. It's very much a direction based thing. That's definitely the yeah the impression that I get. If the script is doing doing its job, the script will tell you what to do, and so will the director. And then the trick is to just meet again, meeting in the middle. Not quite a train ride, but but yeah, it, I know I've got something in my head, and I pref- and I do a line reading. Okay, good. Or let's try it this way. Okay. Yeah. And then we end up with something that everybody seems to like. Yeah, I suppose maybe the only difference might be how long you spend recording. Maybe it would be fair to assume there was more for the TV series, or is that is that too much of a logic the- jump? Boom sessions were four hours, but they were four hours every two weeks okay. for weeks and weeks and weeks, which was fantastic because we did two episodes a week. Um, and yeah, so that do the math, but yeah, <laughs> that, that was a gift that kept on giving. And that was a delightful gift that kept on giving. Yeah, that, that show. I haven't I haven't watched all of it yet, but I ha- I I found it really, really entertaining. That's definitely another another real peak because there's a lot of. The thing that got me into watching that specific because I kind of thought in passing, I was like, maybe it's for a little bit too young. Maybe it's not quite for me anymore. I don't know. But there were loads of compilations mm-hmm. of like, you know, Sonic Boom out of context and all these things are like gags and stuff. And I watched it and thought, this is well mm-hmm. worth giving a go probably. And I, it's it's a real laugh. It's well worth watching um, for anyone who's not for seen everyone. it. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a fantastic show. It's genuinely really, really good. And a shame there hasn't been more I seasons, like honestly. I will say that because it got it got a two season run and there were a lot, but. Would have been nice for it to go further. Fingers crossed, nice. you know. Yeah. There may, who knows a reboot could happen? You never know. It could do. That's not impossible. And well, keep your fingers crossed. And if they know that, you, you know, if everyone's happy for it, then you never know, right? You never know. Um, mm-hmm. 
But let's take a little bit of time to distance from Dr. Eggman, because I know as much as you're you know, for it, we don't want you to only be talking about one character uh, in this chat when you've done so many. And I've looked, obviously, at your resume. I've seen some of the things that you've done, but I, I felt the best way to do this would be to hand the mic over to you, because obviously, as an actor, you have got all these different roles, and obviously, as you'll, you'll no doubt would agree, obviously fortunate that some characters maybe get recognised and get well-known, but there might be others that you've done that you want people to know more about or that you're personally very proud of that you want to share. So just kind of hand hand it over to you. Are there any other roles you've explored in your career that that stand out to you for whatever reason? What else have you been up to when you've not been voicing everyone's favourite genius? Sure. Most recently, I'm in the uh, new Gotham Knights uh, game from the uh, Batman franchise. I play one of the gangster members known as Bulldozer. Now, a lot of people will, the, the, the Eggman style voices are recognizable uh, because as the, one of my new catchphrases is, if it yells, it sells. That's what clients like. So me yelling is me yelling. So when I yell, it sounds the same. I guess it sounds like Eggman. But it's also worth noting that, for example, Eggman, before I booked Eggman, I booked a role in uh, the Berserk anime series. And if you listen back to back, a lot of people will say, wow, a Lord of Dawn sounds like Eggman. Yes and no. First of all, I booked a Dawn first. And the voice that we established as being a Dawn has some certain overlap to Dr. Eggman. But if you listen to Dr. Eggman, Dr. Eggman didn't sound like Dr. Eggman when I first started. Because as I mentioned, it all started as Dean Bristow. And Dean Bristow lasted in Sonic X, the Dean Bristow performance style voice wise thing for the first five or six episodes. And then the director and producer came to me and said, we need, want to make room for more comedy. So we'd like you to add more peaks and valleys to the voice. And they gave me a template of Martin Short's Jiminy Glick character who starts up way up high and then goes way down low. And that's where the Peaky Valley Eggman thing came to be. And that tends to sound like a Don. And they developed independently just because they landed in a comfortable place in my throat. And there are some similarities. But I make different acting choices, which most people don't hear. Oh, it's the Eggman voice. There are acting choices on top of that, which if we were going to go deep in the weeds, I would point out to you. But I make different conscious decisions. So if you watch the Gotham Knights uh, bulldozer character, I guess we consider it as Southern U.S. Eggman. Because you've got this kind of voice, which is sort of eggman but it's also got the Southern accent. <laughs> now, you're not going to hear this voice as Dr. Eggman, because Dr. Eggman doesn't have a Southern accent. But there you go. So you can put in whatever, whatever similarities you want. Now, I will also call attention to a podcast series, and I don't... It's tacky to direct people to one episode of a multi-episode series. But for our, the purposes of our discussion, if you look up Earth Eclipsed, and you skip to episode seven, it's the episode I'm in, there is a very dramatic performance that most people aren't used to hearing. The reason that Sonic Frontiers sounds so different is because people don't hear me do drama. They don't think of me as a dramatic actor. I do, but people want cartoons and fun. Great. Earth Eclipsed, however, it's there's it involves no spoilers. I'm, I'm overcome with grief about a death. Um, spoiler alert. And <gasps> so it's a very dramatic turn, not unlike some of the dramatic performances in Sonic Frontiers. Well worth a listen, if I do say so myself. Then going way back to the early four kids days, as I mentioned earlier, Ella the Maid in Sonic X. Most people don't realize that I was Ella the Maid. It's true. And in Sonic Boom, I was the mayor and I was also fastidious beaver, actually. So <laughs> there are things you might not expect to hear. And some... Some Thank you very much. Some obscure kid shows that I'm in. If you can find a copy of um, Robocarpoli, which is a uh, Korean show that we dubbed into English. And I've been told that even my fellow actors, when dubbing the show, couldn't figure out who the voice of Terry the Truck was. And it was me. I was Terry the Truck. I guess this voice doesn't sound like something you typically hear coming out of my mouth. Well, all right, then. So that's that. And let me think if there's anything else that's even more delightfully surprising. Um, I, I don't want to spoil it because we just wrapped on production, but a, uh, a uh, anime film that we just dubbed the other day. And I use a voice very much like this, which doesn't sound much like Dr. Dragman at all. And you'll be hearing that when it comes out, and maybe you'll realize it's me. Um, there's a uh, another dubbed film. I, I get to dub all sorts of wacky things. Alyssa Knows What to Do, which was, I believe was a Russian production. I play a robot called Polly R. And he actually has a Paul Lind impression, which you don't normally hear me do. But he sounded kind of like that. And you can watch that on the show. And what will amaze people, um, I like to I like to amaze and delight. 
not the Caillou that most people grow up with because they're a lot older now, but in the recent rebooted uh, version of uh, Caillou's New Adventures, which are running on YouTube, I play Caillou's daddy and most of the adult male characters, at least in the early episodes. That shocks the heck out of people because it sounds nothing like Dr. Eggman most of the time. And uh, thank you very much. That's that's how we surprise and delight. And then I always love the opportunity to play multiple different characters in a show. So if you find any of the recent Kiko Riki movies, you may remember uh, Gogo Riki from its four kids days. But later it was uh, rebooted as Kiko Riki. They invited me to come back and play. Uh, he was Gogo Riki. Um, he, no, he was Big Oriki in Gogoriki, but he became known as Carlin, his more Russian name. And I played Carlin in the later version, as well as Barry the Bear and Pin the Penguin. So three different roles all in one show. Uh, and that was a, a very cool compliment to, to be asked to do. Wow. The, do you know what? That, the thing I love, there's a couple of things I really liked about that answer. The first was the, the amount of times that you said you wouldn't expect me to hear. And that was the whole point because there were all these different roles mm-hmm. and it was it was fantastic to hear them. And also just hearing you do some of the voices, especially the Beaver voice from Sonic Boom, because that was the one I was talking about where as soon as I realized that was you, I went, there's no way. There's no way Mike voices him as well as Eggman. Like the, the tonality difference is ridiculous. So when I first heard you, you do that, I was like, that's oh okay all right then (laughs) while eggman is a wonderful thing and a a delightful gift he does overshadow so much else there is so much below the waterline of the iceberg that really i wish people would take a little more notice yeah you know it's especially these days on social media hey i'm in something else and it's not sonic oh a hundred likes okay great thanks Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's the double edged sword, isn't Thank it? You. you know, you can be grateful to yeah. have the fame from one character, fame or at least love and respect for it, however you, you best mm-hmm. prefer to word it, but also that you don't get as much for the other stuff. I, I fully appreciate that. I know and I, I get what you mean. It's uh it's 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 very much a double edged sword, definitely. I'm the only one who is present at all of my recording sessions. So I'm the only one knowing not only how much fun I'm having, but delightful little moments, because people People would like to believe, oh, so your favorite thing is Sonic and it's what you love doing and it's what you live for. It's not. Yeah. Every little thing I do, no matter how obscure and boring to you, sorry, kids, um, there's something delightful. There's a little performance, a little line reading of, wow, that was great. I really wish more people end up seeing, which would, seeing this, which they won't. Yeah. But yeah, I love getting, I love doing what I do and getting the opportunity to have just delightful little moments that will delight me and make me laugh. And you should be delighted too. Exactly. There's there's a, a lot of different roles you've done. And I know you did a, a post on your website at one point called, um, I've got to say, make sure I say this right, uh, Rata, Ratatoying, is that how I say it? Is that mm-hmm. how it goes? Yeah. Sure. Ratatoying Ain't That a Shame, which was a, a big uh, kind of piece about people calling out an old piece of work that you featured and saying, you know, I can't believe you were in this and you gave this big long response. I suppose better to let you explain it, I suppose, the big response that you gave to it. Because I, I honestly, I personally found it really interesting because it was kind of a an honesty that I don't see many people have. People love to shame. They won't admit it, but it's true. So people like to mock uh, those of us in Mockbusters. Mockbusters are foreign films dubbed into English that are quite obviously based on big hit animated films that folks know and love but they're slightly off, or in some cases, extremely off. And there's a local studio who gets the license to dub those into English because there is money to be made and he wants to make money, and he needs to populate those with actors. And he has a reliable talent pool, of which I am one, and he will invite us to come in and dub them. And we're supposed to be ashamed of that when, in fact, the service we provide is we voice things that can't voice themselves and we do it well. So yes, while the material as a whole, material as a whole may be laughable and perhaps embarrassing, my parts are good because I'm good at what I do. So if you can watch it and, and compartmentalize as I often do and say, Oh, Mike's doing a good job in this crappy piece of crap. Thank you. Yes, I do but I am hired to act the hell out of something and I will. And if you want to say, Oh, it's crap. Okay. Thanks for sharing, but it's my crap and it's the crap that I was hired to do. Cause that's my career. <laughs> yeah, so, exactly. Sorry. Don't, you know, I don't, I don't come <laughs> knock the gas pump out of your, out of your hand while you're working at the petrol station. Cause I'm not going to shame you for your job. 
it's a dirty job and someone's got to do it. And as long as you do it well, there's nothing to be ashamed of. Exactly. And that's also where the argument comes from when you, when you watch maybe a TV series or a film and you go, well, that's not very good. And you say, well, you know, th- when someone can do a good job, even with a bad script, for argument's sake, you know, that's that's a very common thing mm-hmm. when someone goes, oh, this wasn't very good, but the performances were fantastic. Like, they are they are two different things. And it, it was interesting, as I said, because when reading that through and you basically kind of re-emphasize and that remember it's a job for you. As much as you're loving what you're doing, it is also a paid income. You've got to remember that you will take what you can get the same, in the same way as, you know, you can go for a big role that you'd love as well as something that will just pay the bills. As I, yes, food, clothing, and shelter aren't free. And even though it may seem less than a wonderful thing to be in, it's still great fun to do. Even the director that produces those, he's not really a people person. He's not fun to work with very often. <laughs> He can be a very hard driving individual, but even so, I will at least have fun doing what I'm doing if the, uh, uh, if the experience as a whole is not great. But as I explain, I am constantly auditioning for work. Gigs, gigs do not grow on trees. So if someone offers a gig and at least it's paying industry standard, which at the time he didn't. So I'm working with him less than I did before, but Fair enough. if the, the pay rate is up to industry standards, then by all means, it's it's work. Work is work. And my goal is to be a working actor, not a bum. So I'd rather be recording a rat tattooing than sitting around looking for work because the looking for work is the work. Getting the work is the fun. And not having either is sitting around doing nothing. <sighs> Not fun. Exactly. Well said. I, I really like And that's, that's, that's what you. everyone can aim for, you know, is that you want, you want a job that doesn't feel like a job. And if you've you've achieved sure. that, then you know there's there's few things in life that are as good as that, right? Sure. And if you're if you're watching and hating your job, sorry. I wish you could love your job like we love ours. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Um, yeah. So the last question that I've got for you uh, to round off talking about other roles, as you said, you're you know you'll take the work wherever you can get it. You love doing your acting. You have done a little bit in theatre, maybe not quite as much compared to your voice roles. Is theatre something you still enjoy doing and would like to do more of? Like, how does that overlap with everything else you do? It's a tough question because uh, as I'm aging, <laughs> it's inevitable. Um, I'm enjoying the the joys of voiceover. Voiceover, to me, is pure acting. There's there's none of the trappings of line memorization, um, makeup, wardrobe, blocking, having to remember where to stand on the stage. Um, having to cancel other engagements so I can have my evenings free. I get to walk in, act for up to four hours without having to remember dialogue and having a grand old time. The last thing I did on stage was a local community production of Susical, just because it was available and I wanted to see if I could do it. And yes, I could. Um, I would love to do live theater Broadway style, but that's that's more competitive even on its own level. So unless somebody comes to me and says, okay, we're doing this show and we need a, a, a celebrity cameo turn and people watching the show would know you come do this, great, but not likely to happen. Um, but even as far as community theater, having to remember dialogue, we went to see a community theater show the other day that we would have been in, my wife and I, but our schedule did not allow. And I'm watching it and saying, well, there's a lot of stuff in here to remember. I guess I could have done this, but it would have been a lot more effort than I'm used to lately. So it's a it's a double-edged sword. If there was a reader's theater thing where we could stand on stage and read scripts, and there are some of those, just not locally, I would probably do that just for the sheer fun. A decade or so ago, actually, this was the more recent one that I did that I forgot about, which I shouldn't have. We did a uh, live radio drama, community theater style, um, we went recorded it in a studio, and then we also went and performed it at a couple of local uh, seniors' homes, and that was great fun. Um, it was basically doing what I do, but in front of people. There's the opportunity for that does not arise, but that was fun just to have a live audience. The sonic live events that we do now and again, where we get to do live performances from our scripts, um, that's also great fun. But it's a different animal. It's Yes, I could do it, but I have I have enjoyed the streamlined version of voiceover for so long that it's like, why bother? <laughs> yeah, it's 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 a bit too different then, isn't it? Yeah, for a special occasion, yeah. But as far as I my my brother in law was a Broadway actor, and he would do eight shows a week in Phantom of the Opera, and so every 
every weeknight he would be on the bus going to the theater and uh, twice on Sunday. And he loved it too, but that's something that would probably bore me. The other th- wonderful thing about voiceover is it's a different script every time. If I'm doing a show, doing a community theater show, that's a couple weeks at a run. If I was in a show for six, eight, 12 months, would it still be fresh after that 12 months? I'd have to make it look fresh, but would that become drudgery? Cause it's the same thing again and again. I don't know. I would probably pursue on camera before stage, but the on camera auditions that I've done haven't gone in my favor. Cause that's competitive too. Yeah. Someday they will perhaps, but it's, it's a, it's a more difficult challenge than the regular voiceover auditions that I've become accustomed to and the voiceover bookings that I love to do. Yeah, no, that, that makes sense. That's, that's fair. Um, and that's, as you said, you know, if you're so used to the voiceover and, you know, if you have provided you're obviously getting enough with that, then, you know, it's, it's not as, it's not something you have to feel as inclined to try and push yourself in a different comfort zone. If you're so used to the, the voice side, and you've got so much done for it, which as we said, you know, you have that place. I mean, you've got, you've had things in like, even just like commercials for like Hooters, like there's a whole range of things that you've done that have been sure. pulled up into, into that playlist. There's a whole lot of, of different roles and, you know, if you get to do all those different ones, that's enough. And it, it's such, as I said, it's such a lovely thing. I think to conclude my question is just the vibe that I've had from all this, just the fact that you love doing what you're doing. It is an income, but you also really like it. You've got all these different things. It doesn't feel like a job in a way. It's a career. It's the career I've chosen. I, I never dreamed as a child that I could be a paid actor for a living, which is why I pursued radio. And then radio had enough of me, and then the theater was still there. This is a branch of theater. That's why people call us voice actors. Voice actor is more of a fan term in the industry. We are actors. We are talent, which is the, (laughs) that sounds like an insult, but that's what they call us because it's a catch-all term. But the voice actor term is really a fan-driven thing. We are actors. One of my other favorite things to say, voice is a specialization, not a restriction. I have a fully functioning body. I could be on stage. I could be on camera. At this point, I'm waiting for someone to hand me an on-camera or theater role, so I'm not pursuing that audition-wise. But if someone were to say, we've got an established show. We'd like you to do a cameo and a walk-on. Great. Be right there. But as far as pursuing that with auditions with the same fervor that I do for voiceover, not likely to happen. It's just, it's a different animal. I occasionally get on-camera auditions. I've done them. I've not done them successfully. And that's mostly because I don't have official training in how to do on-camera auditions. But I don't mind. It's the on-camera auditions are a bonus. If I book one, great. But I go into one hoping against hope. And (laughs) mostly the casting people have proved me right. Say, yeah, we're not booking you for this. Okay, great. So, (laughs) but I'm still doing what I'm doing. And I get to go to studios or here in the home studio and have a grand old time. Exactly. And, and, the the point you made there as well is with voice acting it isn't it isn't so much if you you're doing less work because of, of often times I found is when I've spoken to other voice actors and just a general feel that I get is that in some ways you have to put even more effort in because the voice is all you've got that's coming out on the recipient's end right they're not seeing your facial expressions sure. they're not seeing the effort in your body you've got to put that through in your voice so in in some ways that takes even more work sure I died I've died several times this past week in various video games and uh, animated productions and that takes a toll. I have realized now, as again, as I'm aging and it's possibly a little extra pandemic weight, I've had to sit down between takes because yelling in my top of my lungs <laughs> gets a little whiz, a little winded and dizzy. I just sit out here for a minute. Be fine. But yeah, it is can be physically demanding and physically exhausting. And if I'm yelling and screaming, I need a couple days rest to get this scratchiness out. So I love the challenge, but... It's not just walking into a room and talking. It's a little bit more than that. Yeah. No, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a lot to it. And I'm, I'm, it's been really uh, interesting to kind of dive into that in more detail and explore it a little bit more. So uh, so that wraps up all of my questions, Mike. So thank you very much. So what I want to do now to wrap up the interview is take it over to Twitter. We put out uh, our post to announce the interview a few days ago and took some uh, questions from the community. So I'm going to pull out a few and just uh, see what your responses are to the community. That sound good with you? Absolutely, please. Fantastic. Well, there isn't a, this is one isn't a question, but I thought it's, it's fun to mention because it links to me from uh, from Felix Man, who said, Mike Pollock has easily become one of my favorite actors. He's such a chill guy online. He's great at what he does. I'd love to get a signature someday. So there's someone else. Thank you. <laughs> cool. Well, when conventions happen, there'll be signings in there as well. So keep your eyes peeled or your social media. I don't know what I'm saying. Watch out. Something will be announced somewhere for something. Oh, uh, exactly. Um, 
Let's go with this one from uh, Finn Credible at Finn Dominator, who said, Dear Mike Pollock, first, thank you for your wonderful voice providing over the years. Uh, second, what's your favourite part about playing Eggman? The feel of the character, the voice you get to put on, the, char the character dynamic, etc. What stands out to you the most about playing him? The fact that they keep asking me back to do more. <laughs> you know what? You couldn't have given a better answer than that, I don't think. <laughs> It's the greatest compliment ever. It's one thing to book a role, but it's another thing to come back for a different part of the role. Is it really still? You bet. So sure, repeat business is the best kind of business. Because, you know, I just like the guy who comes to paint our house. He likes it when we come back to paint another room. So sure, it means you're doing something right. And there are a few greater compliments beyond yeah. fans loving it, which is wonderful and, and lovable. But when the client likes it so much that they want you to come back and do more, yes, please. Exactly. No, exactly. <laughs> I love that. It's that and also it's very cathartic. If if I'm going in with a chip on my shoulder and I yell, uh, I, I will yell till my lungs bleed, but I will feel somewhat relieved at the end of the session. Yeah, you know, you, you, you come into the recording session feeling very angry. Once you've shouted about Eggman Land for a little bit, you're suddenly like, oh, I feel better now. Mm -hmm. That's nice. That's nice, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. Butterflies uh, and unicorns. Exactly. <laughs> Oh, um, let's go for the next one. Uh, Elena, speedrunner, wants to know, have you ever cosplayed as any of your characters? So they've said Eggman themselves, but let's widen up. So have you ever dressed up as any of the characters you've portrayed? I haven't. Um, my kids obviously go Halloween cosplaying and convention cosplaying. But the challenge also is the uh, expression of, it's a legal term that I'm, I'm going to butcher, but the expression of one is the exclusion of another. So by highlighting one of my characters and one of my clients, it makes the others feel bad. So unless, if Sega were to come to me, someday they might, and say, okay, we're going to do our next live appearance and everyone's going to be in costume. Okay, sure. But for me to just go and say, look, everyone, I'm highlighting Sega and so much for everyone else, not really appropriate. So, no. Yeah, perfectly valid. Perfectly valid. Always a little joke you want. Uh, HD at Hyperdrive said, would you chase after Roger Craig Smith in real life if you had a real life Eggmobile? Um, probably not because he'd be running too fast. Perfect. Well said. <laughs> um, ooh, okay. Chiron at Whip of Alchemy has said, my birthday is a day before yours. If I was to have a picture of Eggman on my cake, what would Eggman be doing on the cake? Probably eating more cake. Sums it up. That really, really sums it up. Be very meta. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's fantastic. And uh, we'll close off with one more that's, that's uh, thanking you, one more with a joke answer. Which one would you like more first, the concluding uh, thank you or the joke? Uh, let's go with the joke and uh, then we'll uh, possibly leave them laughing with a compliment. Fantastic. Uh, <laughs> Alexander wants to know, uh, Mike, do you like beans on toast? Um, sure, if they're available. <laughs> not really a thing on this side of the pond. Are they not? Are they harder to come by over there? Well, you have to go to specifically to a restaurant that specializes, specializes in British cuisine, of which there are some, but it's not, if you were to ask for that at a, at a local diner here in the States, you'd get such a look. It's like, on purpose? You want that? Yeah, Why do you want that? Thing. I've been asked to, you know, to see if uh, you had it in stock. No, fair enough. I suppose that we take it for sure. granted. I mean, obviously, much. all the ingredients are there. It's just not normally served that way here. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, yeah. <laughs> then we'll we'll conclude with uh, Sarah Nanaka, I hope I'm saying that right, at Lego Iago, who has said, thank you for the opportunity, Troy. I guess if I've asked the question, you're welcome. Thank Mike for that. He's the one who said yes. Uh, Even though I grew up in a small bilingual household, we use Japanese at home, I wonder if Mike would like to acknowledge the fact that Eggman is being appreciated by everyone everywhere. Yes, and that's a fantastic thing. Now, I'll, I'll, remem I'll remind everyone, again, that I'm only a small part of the franchise. If you're watching in other languages, that's not me either. Because, you know, there, he's got a German voice, he's got a French voice, he's, and, and they were, we were all a collection of actors in our own respective languages. English has taken the lead since about 2010, where we, we usually record most stuff English first, and then it gets dubbed into Japanese, which is... A bizarre turn of events yeah. from what we started, but um, and that's a delightful compliment. So yeah, people are matching me versus versus the other way around, which is cool. But there are he has voices in every language because while I'm good with dialects, that doesn't mean I'm good with the actual words beyond menu items. Oh, so. yeah, no, fair enough. That's that's a lot to say. Yeah, with it being such a Japanese known thing, yet yeah, for your voice to be the one that kind of commands it and leads the dubs that is that's a huge compliment that and it's just a mm -hmm. testament to how how long you've played the character and how you know how well known and how loved you are for it so i think that's a that is that's a fab question right on so, so thank you very much for that sarah and 
again, thank you, Mike, for coming on. This has been an absolute pleasure. I can't stress enough how fun this has been. Thank you, Troy. Thanks for having me. It's been a pleasure. I appreciate the love there. It is, it's a love fest, whether sometimes social media doesn't always feel that way. But I appreciate the love that is expressed, and I hope I'm expressing it back because it is a tremendous honor. The only reason I'm here, <laughs> the reason I'm here specifically, is because of Dr. Eggman. So that faithful audition, that faithful, no, that fateful audition one day back in 2003 has meant so much and has led me here. And that's the only reason most people know that and know me. And I can never forget that fact. Yeah, it's it's amazing. It just goes to show how, you know, one audition can make all our difference. And speaking of people mm -hmm. knowing you and being able to follow you. So to conclude, uh, where can people keep in touch with what you're doing and where you're up to? Well, depending on when this gets seen, if Twitter still exists. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's coming out on Saturday. So... I, well, to be fair, yeah. You never know. <laughs> no, yeah, it, 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 if remember Twitter, I'm it's a mic on Twitter. I'm it's a mic on Facebook. There's not much a lot, not much happening there. I guess at some point I'm it's a mic on Hive, but I'm not posting anything there because I don't really have a reason to, and I'm watching to see how that goes. But that just started. Um, Instagram, don't bother. It's there. It's Mike Pollock official, I think. Um, and I, <laughs> I don't know if Reddit's worth promoting because <laughs> Reddit is its own thing. I'm it's a mic on Reddit, and uh, my website is there, occasionally updated with stuff. But yeah, I guess Twitter would be the main place to go. Fingers for now. crossed. And then I guess if it's not a thing, then I guess Hive will suddenly come to more use. Yeah, yeah. Hopefully. And then Mastodon, but Mastodon rejected my application. Really? So they can, pff, that's all. Apparently, because uh, apparently you have to be approved by the server, and I think I signed up twice, and suddenly my login credentials don't work again, and now I can't find the same server I signed up for, and then the other one that was gaming-related, I haven't tried again, because I'm already on Hive, because you don't need to be approved for Hive. Yeah, so. no. <laughs> fair enough. I may try again on Mastodon, but I don't know if there's a reason. That's the thing. Twitter has become such an entity onto itself that now... What do you do? Where do you go? Where do you go know. when it's done? Yeah, there seems to be, I mean, it was mastered on, now it's Hive. It might be something different next week that everyone say, oh, you should get this and make sure you're ready. Maybe we should uh, have a word with Sega, so you think, with an Eggman-themed one. I mean, Twitter's ha used to have eggs for their profile picture. You know, you could try mm -hmm. and have something similar, some some kind of it egg thing, who knows? <laughs> yeah, Twitter shouldn't implode under its own weight, because as long as it's the, the infrastructure is still functioning and someone knows how to not break it, it should still be there. So, yeah, fingers crossed. If not, the viral nature of the internet, we'll all figure out where where to meet again. Don't know where, don't know when. Exactly. Virulent, everyone. Virulent I was going to say, what, what better way to end an interview than with a virulent quote? Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure she's so proud, wherever she may be. Oh, precisely. <laughs> but no, so once again, Mike, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you very, very much for coming on. Thank you, Troy. Thank you so much for having me. And if there wasn't enough, uh, enough egg men, see ya! Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> oh, brilliant.